Well, hello there, YouTube. Welcome to another live portrait painting tutorial. So, uh, yes, I chose the subject to be portrait painting again this time because I tend to really like portrait painting. So let's get into the topic of how to begin a portrait painting. There are many ways, <coughs> excuse me, many ways to begin a portrait painting. Number one is you can start off on a blank canvas like this and draw with raw umber or whatever color you want, like I am going to work. So right over here, I have my drawing color, which is raw umber. Sometimes I'll draw with other colors, but I'm going to draw with raw umber. So you can work in this method, um, which is the umber sketch method, which I have shown uh, many times in the past. By the way, the reference photo will be uh, in this format. I'll be going back and forth to show you uh, the reference photo so that you don't think that I am copying from a reference. And I really don't want to encourage uh, copying from photographs. You want to interpret visual information. So uh, you can start off very loosely like this, or you can start off with a very careful transfer drawing it's totally up to you the method that i'm going to use is going to be drawing directly onto the canvas with paint however i want you to know there are other ways to work and other ways to work are perfectly uh, valid here so uh hey stephanie hey tipu leone hope you are all doing well so i'm looking at the silhouette of the model's face, which by the way our model is uh, Candace. She is a wonderful model that's currently posing for me with my uh, portrait painting class, my in-person class that I'm teaching. So uh, this camera angle is from the angle that one of my students is uh, painting her from. I saw a color on the chat. Oh thank you so much Ronald Miller for the super chat. Um, uh, is my palette on the ceiling? It looks upside down. No, it's, it's on a table. It's just my camera is on a weird angle. Well, thank you so much, Ronald Miller, for the super chat. And super chat to Grumpy Cat is here saying thank you, thank you so much. And super chat Grumpy Cat is going to draw the back side of the model's head. Simple straight lines and angles is very important. And I know that I'm being silly here using this cat to draw the. Um, the background, but now you can say you've witnessed a cat uh, do the block in or part of the block in stage for a portrait painting. So, whenever this painting is finished in the future, you'll know that there was a, a cat involved in this painting. So, uh, for those of you that may be wondering what I'm doing, every time we have a super chat on here, I will introduce super chat to Grumpy Cat. Hey, Carmen. Hey, Hyman. Okay, so I'm following the silhouette of the side of the face. I'm throwing in a little accent marker there, and that's going to be for the side of the eye socket. So that gives me an idea of the turn of the model's head. So uh, she is mostly in profile, but slightly three-quarter view. I'm drawing with raw umber, diluted with a little bit of odorless mineral spirits and I'm using a size 2 Gilbert bristle brush I have another announcement that I will um, show later on or talk about later on thanks Angela hey Autumn you like to do underpaintings this is in a way going to actually be like an underpainting so I have an announcement which involves a painting that I have for sale, uh, but I'll I'll get to that announcement uh, in a little bit, not not right away. So when you're drawing a head, one thing to notice is the turn of the head. So she is pretty much, I'd say, not three quarters, but perfectly in the middle between three quarters and a profile view. A head from the chin to the top of the skull is usually about square. So this to this is usually about square. Moving this edge a little bit further back. And um, obviously I'm taking a measurement from where I think the top of her head is. 
So somewhere up there. So the side of the head on a profile view is about square. She's closer to profile, so I'm instinctively pushing the back of her head a little bit further back. So the lines are really loose. Um, I'm giving myself something that I can work with. This is, in fact, the most stressful part of the process. Uh, I will uh, tell you that when it comes to portrait painting. Though it's all relative. Some of you may enjoy the beginning stages more than the finishing stages. Uh, I prefer the middle stages. Those tend to be my favorite uh, stages in the entire process. So again, looking at the reference here, so uh, the top of her hairline is going to be um, what I'm going to start to lock in place here. So right about here, I'm going to place a mark down. Take a measurement from here to here. This should be about a third, but with our model, it's a little bit bigger. So this to this should be about a third, which is exactly the case here. But it doesn't quite work there, so I'm going to have to lower the shape for the eyebrows. So when you're drawing a portrait, it actually helps to be a little bit more loose with it than tight. If you tighten up, uh, it can get scary. Uh, the process can get a little bit scary. Okay, so now this distance should be a tad bit larger than the nose. And um, if you're unfamiliar with that, the thirds are the hairline to the eyebrows is one third, eyebrows to the bottom of the nose is another third, bottom of the nose to the bottom of the chin is another third. However, we all deviate from that a little bit. And if you're able to catch onto the deviations, then you're able to observe more of the model's intricacies. The more intricacies you notice, the more that they differentiate from the standard proportions, like the thirds that I mentioned, uh, the more of the model's character you will capture. A designs by CAD Pro. Okay, so whether you're working with a delicate transfer drawing or you're working with an umber sketch like this. When you're starting a portrait painting, the most important thing is shape. And uh, all of these little spatial relationships are shapes. And knowing how to work with shapes is absolutely the most useful thing in all of representational art. Because if you know how to work with shapes, you know how to work with proportions. If you know how to work with proportions, you know how to draw. And if you know how to draw, you know how to paint. So that's why it's so important to be able to work with shapes. So I'm using a horizontal line on the reference. I'm running this horizontal line from the bottom of the nose to the bottom of the ear. And the bottom of the ear is just a little bit lower than the bottom of the nose. Not not by much, but it's just a little bit lower. So it's going to fit somewhere about here. Hey Designs by Cab Pro. Uh, you hate portraits, but you keep trying. Uh, I felt that way in the past. I, I did kind of hate portraits when I was just starting. But um, the more you you study it, the more you will you know, learn to, to enjoy it. And I think it's the same with anything that we learn. It, it takes a while to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Hey Jose Francisco, thank you. Okay, see how I'm looking at all of these shapes in relation to one another. This is relating to the nose. The nose is related to the ear. Uh, you don't have to lock it. Just use the chair. All right, I'll see you soon. Okay, so uh, looking from the thirds, this was my first position of accuracy, or at least measuring from here to here. 
relating this from there to there, the angle of the eyes, all of this fitting within the outside parameter of the head. If you learn how to work with these shapes, then you will definitely improve. And now the mouth is going to exist relative to the nose. So her philtrum, meaning the little teardrop looking shape here from the bottom of her nose, the middle of the bottom of her nose to the top middle portion of the upper lip gives us the distance from the bottom of the nose to the mouth. This is the philtrum area. Her philtrum is a little bit longer than the average. And so is mine. I actually have um, the philtrum from my mouth is actually longer too. I can relate the edge of the nose. If I close one eye or just use the edge of the brush, I can relate the edge of the nose to the corner of the lip. And we haven't even gotten into light and shadow shapes yet. Okay, designs by CAD Pro. Uh, Angela is one of our students in the online classes, so she's got a lot of experience with uh, all of the stages involved in, um, in painting and it's definitely a struggle I'd say for all of us but Angela has definitely uh, learned a lot as do all of my online students and speaking of finishing paintings uh, I guess now would be a good time for the announcement that I have so you may have noticed on the comments uh, I have pinned a different type of a message. I have a, a painting, which was the one from uh, last time, and I'll just show you it. Uh, I took the photograph of it, and it is actually available now. So, yes, paintings can start kind of scary like this, uh, but then we add more refinement to it, and then you get something like, like this one. So this is the one that we finished, the portrait painting from the previous uh, portrait painting tutorial style um, live stream. This painting is currently available for purchase on my uh, Etsy, so let me show you now. And I won't talk about this too much, just a little bit to see if anyone's interested. So this painting is available for sale. It is titled uh, Lindsay, a portrait sketch. It is an oil on 12 by 16 inch panel. If this painting is purchased during this stream, the buyer will also receive a free bonus painting of my choice. It will come in the box, the same box that your painting will arrive in. The link to that is posted on the comment section of this chat. It is the pinned uh, message, so it's the top message that you'll see in the live chat. All right, so I'm following the outside. Now the chin is going to be easier to move. So going to the reference, you'll see that the chin, you can actually compare the distance from the bottom of the nose to the top of the upper lip, the philtrum. You can actually compare that to the bottom of the lip to the bottom of the chin. Now the bottom of the chin is only a little bit longer than the distance from the nose to the mouth. So because these shapes are very uh, uh, subtle, you want to make observations like that. So if I, I can literally just use my fingers and if they were equal then they would be too, then this would be too short. If this position to this position was equal to this to the chin, it would be too short. But it is in fact a little bit longer there and it's more square. Uh, more angled. So this shows me, it suggests that this is a acceptable place 
or the jaw, the position of the jaw. The next thing I can relate now that I have the jaw in there is going to be the corner of the neck and you can use the edge of the mouth to locate the edge of the neck. So the corner of the mouth is existing relative to the nose. It's a little bit further to the left. So it's a little further to the left right there. The neck is just a little bit further to um, excuse me this is a little bit further to the right not the left the neck is a little bit further to the left from this point so I'll just do this and then move all the way down and that gives me the relative position of her neck and it's all about relating these shapes now there's one thing that I kind of don't like uh, and I'm gonna add some more paint on here uh, in terms of composition I don't like when things meet up perfectly so the edge of her chin meets up perfectly with the edge of her shoulder I am going to change that I'm not going to make that the same in my painting so I'm gonna move instead of it being right there I'm gonna move it down here and only slightly to about there I'm going to leave a gap there because I don't want it to meet up perfectly uh, it's just one of my weird little tendencies. I don't like when things meet up perfectly. And if I want to, I can just throw a little suggestion for the um, the clothing there. And when you see the, if you're doing an umber drawing like this, once this starts to happen, this little fog like, you see that? That means that I should add a little bit more paint and. Uh, a little more solvent to the brush. We're gonna do that now. So raw umber, solvent. I don't want it to be too much of an ink line, which is useful for other applications, but kind of a um, in the middle between kind of inky and um, well, you'll see what I mean. there and the back of the ear I can be a little more specific with the position of it the ear shape is actually more straight over there's the tragus of the ear the helix of the ear the anti helix and the hair lines here and there for the hair and the um, the I don't know what this is called but the thing on her head the, I was gonna call it a bow but I don't think it's a bow I don't know what it is someone will tell me what it is you'll see what I mean the thing on her on her head. What is the thing on her head? I'm not sure what it is. Um, I don't really know much about fashion. It is fashionable, but I don't know what it is. So let me check the comments, see if I missed anything. Hey, Autumn. Oh, thank you for your uh, comment there. Thanks, Hyman. And CAD Pro. Thanks, Angela. Oh good, I'm glad you liked the explanation in this video. Of course, Angela, I'm going much faster than I do uh, with the online classes, but I'm glad you find this to be informative. There we go. And that should be good for the basic shapes. Now we can go and start to add some color. The first thing I'll do is actually sketch in some of the dark. Hey Ronald, conjunctions can be blurred or seem out of place causing this like of overall subject painted. Autumn it's just the hair tie. Okay, the hair tie. There we go. That's the word. The fancy word I didn't I couldn't come up with. So 
So we're throwing in the values for the shadows and everything now. And those of you that are taking the in-person class with me, uh, I am going to refer to some of the stuff that I'm talking about in this live stream as it will directly help you with your paintings that you're working on. Especially shout out to you, Leonard, um, taking my in-person class and watching my YouTube videos. I'm happy to have you in my class, Leonard. Bandana or a headscarf? Okay, that's a possibility. Hey, Flory Art Gallery. Uh, I'm glad you like my um, my uh, explanations. I will tell you all that yes, this video is titled "How to Start a Portrait Painting," but I encourage you to explore many different techniques, many different methods. Just explore, have fun. Um, now, if you're going to an atelier, if you're going to a very classical style art school, or if you're taking online classes that are uh, structured, like the online classes that I'm teaching, there should be a variety of, of different methods, all based on the same fundamentals. And that's what's important, is the fundamentals. Okay, let's go back to the reference. So you can see the eyes, you can use a horizontal line. This is a very critical stage in the drawing for the eyes, so I am using a horizontal line. The eyes match almost perfectly, though the eye to our left is a little bit lower than the eye to our right. So if I had, if I had gone with this story, it would have been incorrect. And everything is relative. Everything exists relative to one another. That's true, Autumn. Hey, Leone. Uh, oh, good. I'm glad that my video on hands was helpful for you. This is just a dry sable brush that I'm using to move the paint around. The more you do this, the faster you will be. I'm actually not that fast when it comes to drawing. I can make you think that I'm working fast, but in reality, I'm just throwing down a bunch of shapes that are, I'm still not entirely sure of their positions. I'm only ever sure of the positions once I have color on there. And the important thing is just to keep it workable. Don't throw in too many shapes, especially this early in. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to do is start to approach the concept of color. I like to draw with shapes of color. 
do know that uh, of all the methods you can think of with uh, learning how to paint portraits, the method I'm going to show you is going to be one of the most efficient ways to work. However, uh, it is going to be one of the most dangerous in terms of drawing. So if you have some um, any issues with portrait drawing, just basic outlines, just drawing a portrait with just outlines and light and shadow, then the best thing to do is to use black and white paint or just say raw umber and uh, white. I wouldn't jump into color if you are unsure of, um, of drawing. And if you are unsure of drawing, don't worry. Drawing is the most difficult aspect in portrait painting. So I'm mixing up a, a dark uh, kind of an orangey. I'm going with cadmium orange and cobalt blue. Cadmium orange, cobalt blue, and lead white. The palette is a different color than the gray of the canvas, which by the way I didn't even tell you what canvas this is. This is a 11 by 14 inch uh, fine textured oil primed linen canvas. And it was toned with um, black and white oil paint with a little bit of umber, uh, raw umber. So now I'm going to go in with planes. And like I said, if you struggle with drawing, um, don't feel bad because we all struggle with drawing. Um, just use values, don't use color. Though if you want a nice and fun challenge, then do what I'm doing, use color. And I'm looking at the side of the model's eye right underneath of her iris. And it's just a basic shadow color. It looks like it's in the shade, but I'm not quite sure. It's either in the shadow or it's a really dark midtone. Either way, it's dark. So, uh, how to start a portrait painting? It's very important that you focus on the main triangle, whether you're drawing or you're painting in color, or you're painting in black and white. The main triangle is the most useful area to pay attention to. The main triangle, two eyes and the nose, connect the dots, you get a triangle. Connect three dots, get a triangle. And um, I cannot tell you how useful it is to work that way. Now there's some other ways that you can work. Um, I'm not saying this is the only way, but I find it to be the most uh, useful. A little bit of ultramarine blue and dioxazine purple. And I like to use lead white uh, for portraiture and pretty much for everything. Sometimes I'll throw in titanium white for like still life and landscape and things like that, but um, lead white is the most useful for portrait painting because it has this property of which you can add more of it without raising the value too much which allows you to have a thicker consistency of paint which also allows you to have more control 
and the midtone range. Now the sclera, which is the white of the eye, is not white. And this sclera is actually in shadow. And I think I have it a little tall. So I'm going to go with a smaller brush. And now we're positioning the eyes because they're very important to the main triangle. I'm going with the axazine purple, alizarin crimson, and viridian. Another way that you can start a portrait is with a limited palette. Uh, again, uh, a limited palette is the most popular way to uh, approach color with a portrait painting or basically anything in painting these days. But the problem with a limited palette is the limitations. Uh, you won't really have as bright of a, of a chromatic range with a limited palette. Yes, there's some counter examples like the Zorn palette. You can get a lot of a, a huge variety of color with the Zorn palette, but being able to have a much more refined instrument rather than an old one, uh, the limited palette is an old instrument. Uh, the more extended palette is a more of a new instrument with upgrades and everything. It's worthwhile to get acclimated to every tool available to you and choose which one you prefer. A comment from Autumn. I had to turn the reference uh, turn the reference photos because I was using one black and white alongside having a Reference photo helps so much with values and doing the uh, un, uh, umber painting. So um, yeah, that's a good idea. Now one thing to to keep in mind, if you're using photo references like this one, this one is in color. I could turn it into black and white if I wanted to, uh, but the, the the issue is the further I manipulate the reference, the further it's going to be from from life. So I try to emulate painting from life as much as I can. And by from life, I mean from the life model. In fact, what I do is I keep my reference uh, distance away from me. I don't have you notice there's no reference here so I don't keep the reference right next to the face to, to try to emulate if you know, what it would be like if she was posing for me in person hey Angela you're finishing a limited palette portrait of your sister awesome I would love to see it Speaking of uh, seeing each other's paintings, remember last week I created a Facebook group specifically for viewers of this uh, these live painting sessions, uh, live painting tutorials. But not to be confused with the Facebook group that I have for my online students. That's a private group. Uh, but the one that I created for viewers of these live streams is public so anyone can join so oh, let's see uh, comment from RF what should you do if you don't have access to uh, live models self portraits my friend self portraits thank you for that question uh, definitely definitely like that question what do you do when there are no live models self portraits and yes I know most don't like to do self portraits 
You know, I've got one student that has done 41 self-portraits. 41 self-portraits. And he's still doing... I'm, I'm sure he's still going to keep doing more self-portraits. He is a fantastic painter. Yep, it's in the link. Uh, Mariah, the Facebook group. Oh, good, Angela, you turned the portrait upside down. That's a good idea. Uh, turning the portrait upside down or looking at it through a mirror. Uh, also standing back and looking at it from a distance. These are very useful tools. Now I'm looking at the curvature of the model's eye socket. So you see that there is a gradation of tones on the side of the eye socket. And the eyelid is uh, another very useful structure to uh, put more emphasis on. And I'm starting a lot more tight with this one. With the other one, uh, I was a little more loose in the beginning. This one, I'm focusing much more in the um, more subtle structures. So really honing in on the main triangle. So the eyelid is a little warmer. I like to go with cross complementaries, so I'm using orange molybdate, which is equivalent to cadmium scarlet. Mixing into the old pile there, I'm adding a little bit of cobalt blue. That's a little warmer. There's some nice little gradations on the side of the eyelid. And at this point on the palette, I'm just getting, I'm choosing from whatever files that are already there or uh, directly from the paint itself, like this. I'm much more lenient with what color I use. I'm more focused at this point on the value. Make sure to always stand back. Keep yourself at least an arm's length away from your painting. Throw in a little bit of a lizard in there for the accent where the upper eyelid meets the edge of the eye socket. Hey Janusz. Now I'm going to go for a darker middle tone. And this is by far one of my favorite surfaces to work on. 
oil primed linens. Although I do like working on panels at times. Adding a little more warmth. So I'm going with Caroline Red, Alizarin Crimson. Mixing right into the pile that was already there. Hey, Great White Hunter. Oh, well, thanks for watching. I push a little bit more form. Now today we might make it down to the nose and some of the forehead. And this is how I'm gonna work with this painting. Sometimes I'll go and I'll cover all of the light and all of the shadow and work with big masses of color. Other times, I'll just go right into uh, smaller structures like these. I want to show you that you don't have to work the same way with the same approach with every single portrait painting. And um, those of you that are taking the in-person class with me that may be watching this as a pre-recorded video, we are using the classical approach. So what you're seeing here is the reverse of what we are doing in class. In class, we're going from the outlines to the values to the colors. This is the reverse, uh, which is a little more dangerous in terms of drawing but um, it's more efficient. So I'm looking at the planes surrounding face, or the eye, excuse me. You see the light right next to the eye in between or right on the cheekbone. This one. Plain, 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 and plain. These are all plain changes. Now I'm going to adjust the light sensitivity of my camera. So you can see the color a little better. The Angela uh, question usually uh, are the eye sockets usually warm or cool? Uh, it is. It varies. It depends on the light conditions. It it depends on the model um, but I will say usually warm there's usually some more blood flow around the eyes but there can be exceptions such as like a blue light for example really cool daylight things things of that nature
and uh, figure painting in color. We're not doing figure painting in color using um, master studies as our or creating master studies in the online classes. Um, that's our how we're doing figure painting. We are actually constructing the figure painting in the same method that I am uh, using today. So online students, if you want more uh, reference material to working directly with color, this will be a useful resource for you. So again, how to start a portrait. Um, work from the darks to the lights is another piece of advice I will give you. Whether you are drawing in pencil or working in black and white or with color. Go from the shadows to the dark lights and work your way to the light lights. Hello, thanks for watching from Egypt. This angle here is very important uh, because this gives you, right when this plane changes, right when the glabella moves down towards the nasal bone, this area here is the root of the nose. It is the physical beginning of the nose. So if you don't take into account this angle, you may end up making the nose a bit long. And I suggest that you use the same palette, same color palette, for everything. Portrait, landscape, still life, wildlife, whatever it is. Use the same palette for everything. You want to have complete control over your color. You want this to be like the keys to a piano. And I actually suggest that you leave the paints on the edge of your palette. Keep the mixing space clean, as clean as you want to. But if you train your muscle memory for the uh, specific location of colors, you really don't have to think much. It becomes more intuitive. And I'm looking at the corner of the nose. The color is a little bit too green, but in the reference, the corner of the nose is a little bit more round. So I'm trying to go after that effect. A question from Valerie. Yes, the, the reference. I'm showing the reference. If you mean um, have the reference be on the edge of the screen, I'm trying to move away from that, but I can do that next time if um, you know if everyone prefers that. 
The only thing with having the reference right there, as opposed to me showing you, is that um, every time I show the reference is because I'm mentioning something specifically on the reference uh, that I want you to look for. Uh, like for example, the edge of the bottom of the wing of the nose on her right side. So basically her nostril in the shadow. I'm looking at that shape and now I'm going to place it. Yep, no problem. No problem, Valerie. Alright, now I'm going to do something that I really didn't want to do, and that is uh, mix up the shadow color. The reason I didn't want to do it is because I have to use another brush. I don't feel like cleaning another brush, but it looks like I'm going to have to. <laughs> I'm just that kind of person. So I'm using Viridian and Cadmium Orange to make kind of a brownish green. Looking at the shadow color here, it's it's kind of similar to that. It's, it's more in the in the greenish side. Hey, Tipo, you prefer to look at the model? Let's see, model photo as I paint. All right, let me. Let me see about that. Just give me one second. Now the the photo may be really large at first, so I'm adjusting it right now. Uh, but if that's what you prefer and there you go and there it is so I will have that there but just remember that it's not a uh, copy I'm not trying to make a copy of it but if that's what you prefer I will have it there for you If you want the palette there too, I can do the same. Just feel free to ask. Oh, that's right. You you might want this photo there too. Hold on a second. There you go. So you'll have it in the close up and the further away view. Yep, no problem, Tipu. Okay, LCM. What sort of medium am I using? Uh, not using any medium at the moment. I'm just using um, just the paint and odorless mineral spirits. So I'll show you um, how I do that. So if I want to paint the thin out a little bit, I'll just use a touch of odorless mineral spirits. Now I'm going to draw the edge.
So I like to work with brighter colors and then I tend to kind of tone them down as I go. So a skin tone that's slightly a little more orangey. Hey Rob, um, let's see. Would you use a color other than raw umber? Uh, I would use it for any skin complexion to draw. Um, raw umber is just very useful because it dries fast and it's not very bright uh, it's not a very chromatic color and when you add white to it it becomes gray so that's why i use raw umber i don't use it for skin colors i may have mixed on top of it there but i actually don't use raw umber to mix color with Though you can, and I've done it in the past, but usually I like to use more uh, bright colors and I neutralize them as I go. Hey, Libertas. That was fast. We went all the way to White Oak. Wow. All right, so I'm looking for planes. Hey, Ronald, so you've mentioned you always started with mute and then added more colors. It's easier to, um, like you mentioned, that color it down um, than it is to add more chroma. I mean, it varies really. I mean, you can glaze more chroma if you want to. It's all just personal preference. This is the way Nelson Shanks would work. Nelson Shanks is, of course, my superhero. I, I tend to always mention him. If you haven't seen Nelson Shanks' paintings, definitely check them out. There's a little pocket here on the side as the side plane of the nose transitions into the cheekbone. This gives us the maxilla area. I think I'm just going to put the palette here in this view for you to see. Uh, where is it? Oh, that's too small. Never mind. That was the reason why I have this camera angle, so you can 
see specifically uh, what I'm mixing. So for example, this one's going to get a tad bit, let's say, a little bit darker. A comment from Autumn. They now have only down the limited palette of colors for acrylic and watercolor. Maybe someday for oil paint. Yeah, definitely. I encourage you. Give it a try. Remember, they also have water mix of oil paints. So from Dan, any coaching on how to approach mixing colors to make the color you're trying to match? Good question. And a little play on words here. I usually don't try to match uh, the colors. I instead try to relate the colors to one another. So is one shape more green than the other shape? Is it more blue? Is it more orange? Uh, I go across the color wheel to try to figure out how the colors work in relation to one another. It's a little weird because when you're working from a reference the tendency is going to want to be to match the color. When you're working from life, you cannot match the color unless you use a device to do that. Uh, and if you use a device to match a color when you're painting from life, you're painting that color in isolation. But the color, the visual experience involves seeing colors in relation to other colors. You can't just isolate one color and expect to get it right in a painting because it is surrounded by other colors. A little play on words there. And what I do is I relate colors to one another. And there are three components to a color. is hue, value, chroma. So I'm constantly relating these things. Oh, thanks, Ronald. There, there's no wrong or a right way it's really just about what's more comfortable for you uh, in the end of the day when someone or the end of the week or month however long it takes to paint the painting no one's going to know if you started with bright colors and then went with more subtle colors or started with subtle colors you know vice versa no one's really going to know so um Unless you're filming it, of course. Uh, it's totally up to you which approach you prefer. That's one of the things I really like about painting is it's so open. Now I'm looking for the shadow color underneath of the nose. It's just this is just a basic starting point. I'm thinking value is darker. Uh, the hue is to, closer to the warm brown. Uh, the chroma is not that bright, which is why I went cross complementary. But you see, I don't have all that in my head as I'm mixing because if I think about all that in my head while I'm mixing, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. There's gonna be some screws that are gonna come loose. They might have already come loose, but um, it's more instinctual. I know that that's weird. I know that that sounds strange, that it's in, uh, in intuitive. But the more you paint, the more you build your intuition. It's like any many things. Many things are like that. Recently, I've been getting into pool um, billiard. Some people call it shooting billiard or pool or whatever. Um, I, I have to look at systems like, um, uh, like one system with that is I think um, ghost ball technique in, in billiards and um, the other one is fractional ball uh, in, in billiards and it's a way to measure how you hit the, hit the ball at the correct angle to get it to go into the pocket. The pros from my research they don't think about that it's just in their mind. It's intuitive to them. Um, I am not a pro at billiards. Um, I I have a lot of experience with painting. I'm not even going to go there. But um, 
for example, learning something for the first time, it is useful to have systems, I'm not going to lie. So uh, with skin colors, a system you want to think about is either pink, pinkish, orangeyish, or greenish. And just keep it that simple. And here you can see a variety, pinkish, orangeyish, greenish. And then you also have the grayish or the bluish over here. Um, think about it that way. Um, maybe don't think about is it specifically like a blue green, just green. Is it green? Is it red? I'm looking at the corner of the side of the, for example, let's look at the big reference photo. I'm looking at the value of the shadow next to the nostril. And it's more in the pinkish, it's closer to the red. So I'll go for that. I know that many of you are probably like billiard pros or experts, um, or pool experts, which I am not. But it's just an analogy. Hey, Autumn, you used water mixables? Yep, they, they are really nice. Hey, Autumn. Oh, muddy colors. I like that you uh, ask that. So, um, I don't believe that muddy colors exist. Now, sure, you can look at burnt sienna right out of the tube and call it muddy. Uh, I'm not going to deny that. There are some colors that do look like mud, but um, I don't believe in muddy colors, rather uh, colors that are not relating properly to one another. So for example, um, if I tried to match the color, suppose I, I match the color that I'm painting right here perfectly to the reference, but it doesn't work in relation to the surrounding colors, even though I mix the color properly, I can use a computer program if I want to, a software to tell me that that color is exactly spot on with the color of the reference. If it doesn't work in relation to the surrounding shapes, it will look um, like mud to you. It will look like mud. So it's all about color relationships. The best way to study color relationships is not to try to do a commission portrait because your mind is elsewhere when you're doing a commission portrait. Uh, rather, doing color studies of things that are not that dangerous or careful or um, things that are not as difficult to draw, like a teacup. Uh, if you do a color study of a teacup in the sunlight, uh, you will learn so much about color and a teacup as simple as it may seem can improve your portrait painting abilities because you learn how to mix intuitively you learn how to relate shapes to one another uh, you learn that everything is color uh, and, and you learn not to be afraid of color and then when you're painting something more difficult like a nose like an eye or something like that it's a teacup it's just like a teacup. You'll, you'll think of it like the teacup that you are studying. Hey, hey Marlon. Uh, thank you. And just like a teacup would have plain changes, whoops, I forgot to, uh, just like a teacup would have plain changes, uh, the face also has plain changes. Everything that has form has a plane. Each plane change can be described through a color change. You want to relate these planes of color to one another, and that's how you're going to get uh, away from the uh, muddy effect.
And also be open-minded to making changes. So the value of the nose, the bulb of the nose, the top of the bulb of the nose is a little dark. So I'm in a very subtle place with this value. There's absolutely nothing wrong with getting it wrong. There's nothing wrong with getting it wrong. Remind yourself, there's nothing wrong with getting it wrong. The best thing is to know that you got it wrong. And then make the adjustments. That's how you learn. And in fact, that's how a painting is built. No one, no one paints a portrait making every step correct first try. They, they'll make it look like it, but they don't. And it's always a series of adjustments. Oh, thank you so much for the super chat, uh, Marid. Marid K, thank you so much. And super chat means you know what time it is. Super chat to Grumpy Cat, thanks you. Uh, Marid K, thank you so much for the super chat. And Dan, uh, also thank you so much for the super chat. Um, is wet on wet the beginner's way to paint and oil paint? Uh, Dan, it is totally up to you. Uh, Carlos Duran, John Singer Sargent's teacher, had them painting directly with uh, color when he began his apprenticeship with Carlos Duran. Um, so there's there's many schools of thought that will get you to paint wet on wet first, others that will make you do uh, otherwise. My suggestion would be experiment with both doing with drawing uh, starting with drawing and then adding color and then starting with color and then um, working that way that would be my suggestion for you so thank you so much dan for the super chat so we've got uh grumpy cat holding multiple brushes here very very happy for the super chat and as always we are going to have super chat grumpy cat do a little bit of painting for us so, Super Chat Grumpy Cat, uh, what are you going to tell me here? Super Chat Grumpy Cat says, you know what? Uh, the plane on the side of the wing of the nose, don't you notice that that has more heat to it? Can't you see the color, Yupari? You should know better than that. So, Grumpy Cat, uh, Super Chat Grumpy Cat is coming over here uh, and going to Paraline Red. But Grumpy, why are you using Paraline Red? Grumpy says, I'm using Paraline Red because you failed to notice that there needed to be a higher key pink that leans towards the orange on the wing of the nose. So I'm just sitting here and listening to uh, Super Chat Grumpy Cat. And let's see what Super Chat Grumpy Cat will do here. Super Chat Grumpy Cat says, yes, it is the same value that you had before, but you had the light key, you had the chroma range off. And now you can see that you can relate the background color to the wing of the nose and compare them. This one needs to be darker than the surrounding values, but it also is almost as pink as the background, but it is a little bit less saturated. That's what Grumpy Cat tells me. And you know what? I think Grumpy Cat might know a thing or two about colors. And once again, uh, Super Chat Grumpy Cat says thank you so much. Oh, and we got another Super Chat Grumpy Cat. Uh, from uh, Stephanie Thompson. Thank you so much for the super chat, Stephanie Thompson. We're gonna keep this going. All right, let's do this. Uh, Grumpy Cat says, you know, it needs to be a little bit darker and a little less chromatic. So if you're working with a, um, so here's Grumpy Cat. If you're working with a red, how to how to make it less saturated? Go with its complement. Go with green. But be careful, don't put too much green because it will go brown. So as Super Chat Grumpy Cat goes back to the Paraline Red, she is also going to add a touch of lead white. And Super Chat Grumpy Cat says, Don't you know how to work with color, Yupari? Don't you know how to mix these colors? You've been painting for almost 14 years now. You should know how to paint the wing of a nose. So now, uh, here we go. Super Chat Grumpy Cat is adjusting the color. 
Super Chat Grumpy Cat says, don't you see now? The value is a little bit darker than the surrounding shapes, and it's also a little bit more neutral than the background, whereas before you had them too close. So, Super Chat Grumpy Cat is correct once again. So, thank you so much for the Super Chats, everyone. I'm glad that you're enjoying the, the colors. Super Chat Grumpy Cat's going to be full of paint at some point in the future. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the cat still has the tag on. Well, thank you so much for the Super Chats. It really does help me out so much. I hope I don't annoy anyone with my, uh, my uh, Super Chat Grumpy Cat. You gotta have fun. I, I don't want to be the that teacher that's just like monotone the whole time and just x equals y equals z thus therefore in conclusion kind of thing. I, I want things to be fun to an extent, of course. There's a plane change for the side of the, the nose there. Hey Annie. Oh good, I'm glad that the that color is making the skin tone pop. You see how I tend to um, reuse different puddles. Hey Annie, this is true. A grumpy cat can paint, we, we can all paint. Very true. Grumpy cat has been teaching me a thing or two. And the importance that grumpy cat was talking to us about was chroma. And not everything is going to be the same uh, degree of chroma. So for example, there's a darker red plane change for the side of cheekbone here. It is a darker red. Yes, it goes red, but it doesn't grow it doesn't grow go as chromatic as this. So I can relate these two to one another. They're similar, but this one is certainly brighter. Uh, brightness means um, saturation. Saturation means chroma. I'm using a lot of words to essentially say the same thing. Uh, saturation and chroma are the same thing, like how bright is something. I'm going to add a little more light. Hey Marid, uh, would love to see the background in olive green color. Which is the complement of skin tones. Um, that's a good idea. I have used greenish backgrounds for a similar reason. Uh, I chose the pink. I'm not sure why I chose the pink when I took the photo reference that day. Uh, it was the beginning of my in-person portrait class. And to be honest, I chose the pink because I just uh, I needed something in the background. But I kind of like the pink. When I started uh, my, my in-person class students, they uh, they are working in monochrome first, so the color of the background doesn't quite matter. And now we're moving on towards the uh, top of the orbicularis, which is a little more yellow, not bright yellow, but it's more yellow than this. Now the problem with photo references is that they distort everything, especially color. So I know from memory that this has to get a little bit towards the yellow. But don't get me wrong, it's not a bright yellow. These colors are very subtle, just as subtle as values can get. 
But we're going to keep working on this for the next couple uh, YouTube live streams, meaning the next couple weeks. So you'll see this painting evolve. And you can leave the painting at any stage, any stage you want. And you can keep working on it wet into dry. Totally up to you. Oil paint is very, very forgiving. So now that we have about four minutes left, I'm going to remind you of the sale that I have going on for the portrait painting from last time. So the portrait painting that we created last time, and I'll only talk about this for a minute or two, don't worry, I'm not going to uh, you know, talk too much about it, but uh, this is the painting that we created last time. It is a 12 by 16 oil on panel, and the entire process of this painting is um, on YouTube. The same process, the same style as how we are starting this one with some differences, but uh, same kind of approach. This painting is available for sale at the moment and there is the information. Uh, the link is in the description box of this video and the sale is about to expire in about mm, I guess four minutes, three minutes. If you buy the painting during the live stream you will also get a free bonus painting in the box of which you receive this painting. So, uh, no pressure, there's only about three minutes or actually there's only two minutes left before that offer is off the table. But don't worry, um, I will still have that painting available for sale after this live stream if it doesn't sell. So it gets a little darker on the globella. Hey Omni Panda. Oh no problem designs by CAD Pro. Hey Dan. Um, do most artists start with the eyes? Not all, but yes, most portrait artists will start around the eyes and the nose. Hey RF, can I keep my in progress paintings clean in a very dusty environment? Um, that's a good question. Um, I do have to vacuum the carpet around here a lot for that reason. And I want to say, um, if you're working on a painting in the middle, if it gets dusty, it's not a problem. But you want to be careful when you varnish it. So make sure before you varnish a painting, you always go over it with white spirits or odorless mineral spirits. Uh, just to get rid of any extra dust or something. Uh, clean the painting very well before you varnish it, but if some dust gets into the middle layers, it's not a big deal because you're going to paint over that layer anyway. But very good question. I don't think I've ever been asked that before. Let's see, Marid, the pink in the reference, the background is low chroma. It, it's higher chroma than this, but yes, it's lower chroma than that. Yes, you are correct. The next time I will continue to adjust the uh, chroma range. And we'll continue to tighten up the um, area around the nose. And I'll have more paintings available uh, for sale. It's just I tried to do the little um, sale that I used to do back in the day.
Emirat. Oh, you're talking to Dan. Yeah, big shapes first is usually a, a constant. Whether you're working with color directly or with value. Let's throw in a brighter light there and this will be good. So next week when we pick up on this, uh, we're going to go back here, add some more refinement, and then continue to work all the way around. So this may, may take a couple uh, live streams to complete, but this time I focused my um, attention on how to begin a portrait and that there are different ways to approach a portrait other than the method that I am demonstrating here. The next time we will talk about um, something else specific to the development of painting, uh, portrait painting, and most likely we'll delve more into planes and color relationships between the planes. Oh, thank you so much, Linda, for your comment. So this is the time where I will hang out for a minute or two and see if there are any, any last minute questions. And the painting that I had for sale is still, the link is still going to work after this stream. So if you're watching this as a pre-recorded video and you're interested in that painting, it should still be available for sale. I'm going to rotate the painting so you see it with less distortion. Um, more glare, of course, but less distortion. Of course, we got only this far, but that's because I chose a different uh, approach with this. Well, thank you, Leone. Uh, thanks, Dan. Well, thank you, Ronald. So I'm just hanging out for a minute or so to see if there are any last minute questions. And Super Chats and Grumpy Cat says thank you so much to all of you uh, that gave me a Super Chat uh, during this live stream. It really, really helps me out so, so much. So once again, uh, another thank you to those of you that gave me Super Chats during this live stream. So Ronald has written a question. I've seen this approach. Is it harder? Um, I'd say for me it's easier. This approach is easier for me because I can I can see my mistakes more clearly with color uh, and I can add shapes directly into this loose drawing so it, this, for me it's easier. For some it may also be easier but for others it may be more difficult. Well thank you uh, Mariah. Hey Ronald, in, in general it is easier for most students to start with monochrome. It, that is correct. In general it is easier. With my online classes uh, for like the first, I don't know, like five projects or so we started 
completely with monochromatic underpaintings. So it, it would be easier to start with uh, monochromatic, though uh, I do encourage some experimentation with color. And that's how you start a portrait painting. With big shapes, relationships, whether it be with color relationships or value relationships. You're relating big shapes to one another. That is the essence of beginning a portrait painting. It's all in the relationships. Alright, so it seems like we don't have any extra questions. So once again, thank you all so much for watching. Uh, remember, if you would like to take your online art education with me further, please check out my online classes on patreon.com slash artist. Also typed out for you in the description box of this video, the online classes start at just $10 a month, uh, which allows me to give you uh, direct feedback with your ongoing artworks among many other benefits that you can have in the online classes. So thanks again. I wish you all the very best in all of your artwork and I'll see you on the next one.